Hi! Today we are continuing the Red Riding Hood series, in which I rewrite the story in the style of various famous authors. Today, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Before we get to the story itself, let me say a few words about why I do that and why you should do it too. In painting, copying works of old masters is a standard curriculum element that you'll see in most serious art schools. Through copying, you add the techniques that those old masters used into your own repertoire. Same with writing. Of course, you won't learn anything if you just copy somebody's work word for word, but by trying to capture the style of a particular author, you learn to better appreciate the techniques in their writing craft, thus becoming a better writer yourself. Generally, you could imitate the author's prose style, commonly used plot devices, and also the themes prevalent in their work. In my Philip K. Dick imitation, I tried to an extent to hit all of those three points. Now, since Dostoevsky wrote in Russian, it would not make too much sense to imitate his prose style in English because you'd mostly be imitating the translation. Therefore, I focused on the last two points. Now, let me humbly present to you the fruit of my labor. So sit back and relax, maybe grab a cup of coffee or tea, and listen to the story. Red Riding Hood by Fyodor Dostoevsky the wolf circled the house. It drew him in with the smell of food, warm light coming from its windows, and a promise of hope, arresting and futile. Biting, unforgiving cold dug into the wolf's aching joints. Hard, icy snow scraped against his blistering paws, filling every step with anguish. He knew he ought to go back to the pit and rest, but how could he? For five days already he had not eaten as much as a stale vole, and neither did his mate and cubs. The wolf pushed his snout between the wooden pickets of the fence and gazed at the smoke rising from the chimney. A whiff of wind came from the house, carrying a hint of warmth from the hearth burning inside and the tantalizing fragrance of a steaming pork broth. His stomach twisted and groaned. Saliva drooled from his gaping mouth and froze into tiny icicles dangling on the fur on his lower jaw. Maddened by his hunger, he clawed and bit at the fence until his teeth ached and his gums began bleeding. Forcing himself to turn away, the wolf lowered his nose to the ground and concentrated, trying to pick up a trace. A dead rat, a mouse, he would be content with anything. He knew that he was putting on an act, a pretense of following through with his duty. Whatever traces might have been there would have been washed away by the recent snowfall. But what else could he do? So he carried on, stumbling along the fence and sniffing the snow when a sound caught his attention. The squeaking of a house door and the dull echoes of heavy steps on a wooden porch. The wolf peered through the fence again. An old woman was carrying a pot outside. He whined and pleaded, scratching at the fence with his aching paws, trying to get her attention. The woman looked at him, hastily put the pot on the ground and retreated into the house. She came back with another appliance which the wolf did not know the name for. It was large and round and its polished surface glittered with gold. One of its sides had a crane, and steam came out of the opening on its top. Perhaps the kind woman would share her meal, the wolf thought. He sat obediently and watched the woman approach him, holding her strange contraption, one hand on the handle, one hand clutching the bottom. Sidi, Sidi Tiha, the woman said in her strange tongue, slowly coming closer. Her voice was kind, the wolf thought, and wished he could understand her. It was not until the scorching hot water splashed over his chest that he realized his mistake. He bolted away a few paces, then fell into the snow and rolled, whining and yelping, trying to quell the scalding pain. What he took for kindness was deceit and cunning. Would you not forget Stop tebe ni povadna bila? The woman yelled at him. Through a slit in the fence, the wolf saw her dump the bones from the pot into a hole in the ground. How many tasty, chewy bones there might be! He thought, how many wolves would have been fed and happy with them? But the bones rot in the pit and the wolves starve to death. How is that fair? How does that accord with the God's design? He did not know. Perhaps there was no God's design, he thought. Perhaps the cold, the suffering and the bones rotting on the other side of the fence were all there was to this world. Limping on his scalded paws and grunting in pain, the wolf made his way home and crawled into his wintry pit, where the two surviving pups lay on the ground, huddled together. 
languid from cold and hunger, they did not raise to greet him. Only a faint flare of their nostrils acknowledged his coming. Gala, his mate, was gun hunting, but her smell still lingered. She won't be back any time soon. He lay beside the pups and huddled them to give them warmth and company, for he had nothing else to offer. Despite his burned and aching chest and paws, he was soon sound asleep and slept till Gala returned, deep into the night. She clambered inside the den, swaying with fatigue and carrying a dead squirrel in her jaws. The wolf took in her frail, bony figure, her patched, uneven fur. He thought of the times when her lush silver coat glittered under the moonlight, like a benevolent Ignis Fatus luring him into the depths of the forest, where they'd spend their nights free of care and full of love. He thought of the times when winter seemed not as cold and the game not as scarce, when he was a pack leader and she his proud companion. He thought of his brothers and sisters, now all hunted, starved, or left wandering in search of a better life, never to return. A howl rose in his chest, but the wolf suppressed it. The pups were still asleep, and the hunters were not. Gala put the squirrel by the pups and curled beside the wolf, resting her head on his neck. The burned skin on his chest stretched and made him wince. He clenched his jaws not to stir. Soon a dreary restless sleep engulfed him and carried into the morning. When he woke up, Gala was still sleeping. Gary, the stronger of the two pups, was chewing into the remnants of the squirrel, giving Remus, his brother, mean snappy bites on his snout each time he tried to approach. The wolf watched them unmoving. Is it all there is to life? He thought, let the fittest survive, let nature run its course, let God's will prevail. He remembered the bones rotting in the pit by the old woman's house. Let God's will be damned, he thought, but did not stir. It would have felt righteous to force them to split the meal, but with not enough food for two it meant starving both to death. At last, Gary took a step back, leaving a few half-chewed bones untouched. Remus slowly crept towards the paltry meal, throwing apprehensive glances at his brother. When Gary made no move to attack, Remus gnawed at the scraps with a lethargic effort, with no joy or vigor in his eyes. When the sound rose high in the sky, the wolf tried to get up, but his hurting body refused to listen, and he spent the day falling in and out of an easy sleep. Gala returned in the evening, exhausted and empty-mouthed. Her emaciated look helped the wolf muster the remnants of his strength and go out for a night hunt. He tracked a pheasant that perched on a branch too low for it to be safe. But the wolf's aching paws failed him at the leap, and the bird slipped away. In the dawn, as he was limping back to his den, the wind brought to him the smell of fear and confusion, mixed with something he did not have the heart to name. Galvanized by apprehension, the wolf galloped the rest of the way, even though he knew there was no longer any reason to hurry. Inside the den, he found Gary whimpering and nudging Remus with his nose, rocking his brother's lifeless body back and forth like a human cradle. Their mother was already gone on another hunt. The wolf carried his son's body to the forest road a league away and buried it there, covering it with snow and dead branches. It was better this way, he thought. There was no need for Gala to see. His mind empty, his body numb, the wolf waded into the road and trudged along, staring with an unseen gaze into the white snow under his feet, with no regard for hunters or travelers he might encounter. So he walked, for how long he could not tell, until the smell of meat and bakery made him raise his tired eyes. No more than two leaps from him stood Red Riding Hood, holding a woven basket. Oh, здравствуй, волк, хочешь? She said, proffering a meat pie in her outstretched hand. The wolf knew the girl, she'd been kind to him before. But now, looking at her full, ruddy cheeks, at her small, frail figure, he could not help thinking how easy it would be to snap her puny legs, dig his teeth into her tender neck, and of how Gala and Gary would be then fed through the winter. How base, how full you've become! The wolf told himself, appalled at his thoughts. The day we feed on human cubs, he thought, we won't be wolves anymore, perhaps turning into hyenas or coyotes on the spot. He stood aside not daring to approach the girl for fear that his beastly instincts would get the better of what pride he had left. Seeing the wolf's hesitation, Red Riding Hood put the meat pie on the ground. No, ладно, пока, волк, she said and went on her way. Cautiously, 
the wolf took the pie in his teeth and, without yet knowing why, followed the girl along the road. Alright, so there are two reasons why I stopped here. One cool and one true. The cool reason is that Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky's most famous work and the main inspiration for my imitation, was also published in a piecemeal manner in 12 monthly installments. The true reason is that I need to keep the video to a reasonable length and also because narrating the story and adding illustrations and sound and editing and all takes a lot of time, more time than I can currently afford. If, however, this video gets reasonably popular, let's say at least a thousand views, and there is a request for a continuation in the comments, I will release the rest of the story. All right, now it's time for the most important part of doing any exercise, especially in writing. Self-assessment. Without it, you cannot really improve. I was relatively happy with how the story turned out. I was especially glad that I managed to tap into the theme of moral ambiguity and how cruel and unforgiving our world is, especially for those among us who are weaker and not as strong, not as capable of standing up for themselves. At the same time, I felt that my messaging was a little bit too much on the nose and too directly stated, which I personally hate. So overall, I'm gonna give myself three and a half out of five stars. All right, so I hope that me releasing this very imperfect writing exercise attempt would inspire you to, you know, relinquish whatever worries you have and do this exercise as well, or maybe do some other writing exercises, or go back to writing your book or short story. Nothing needs to be perfect as long as you're writing and as long as you're evaluating your writing afterwards, you are improving as a writer and you're getting better. So do that. And with that being said, bye for now and have a great day.